Thank you very much for the introduction, Lyra. And before I begin, I want to thank three people in particular. Uh, Lyra, first for you to for um, you know putting my book in all the registrants' hands. I mean, it's not, it's a big investment, obviously, for the alumni association. But when I reached out to you to see what was possible. You didn't hesitate. You found this resource to be helpful, and uh, you made it happen. So I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank Anne for um, organizing such a great event. You've done. Uh, you reached out to me in uh, middle of in the middle of May, just asking the question, "What's possible? Are you interested?" And here we are, two months later, with um, a series of uh, great presentations that we've all been enjoying. So. Thank you for orchestrating that. And the unsung hero, there's always one in every event like this, is Diana Garcia, at least for me she is. She's been instrumental in uh, sending out announcement after announcement and uh, providing me lists to send books out. So Diana, um, special thanks to you for um, you know, allowing me to nag you as many times as I did over the last several months and you made it all possible. So thank you very much. Let's go to everyone. Uh, today's discussion, I'm going to talk for about an hour or so or until they pull me from stage about succeeding in today's economy. Now, we all define success slightly differently. No problem, no problem. So uh, we're going to talk for as long as we can. And please uh, type your questions in the chat box as they come up. But I want to talk about embracing the conundrum of life. Life has shifted in a direction that we are not accustomed to. And tonight's discussion is going to focus on what the heck can we do when things don't go our way. Before we begin, though, let me give you a, a brief glimpse of my background, just so you, you know a little bit more about me. I am a Cal Poly alum, graduated in 1994, back when the program was called HRT. And uh, then I went on to earn my MBA from the University of Redlands. I currently teach at three uh, great schools. One is right down the street from you, Mount Sac, where I'm teaching restaurant management. And I also teach at National University and Mount St. Mary's presently. And I've also taught at those other two schools for about 10 years. Uh, my Right after Cal Poly, I went to work for Pizza Hut for about seven years, then to uh, extend its day America. So I switched to the hotel side. In both cases, I was a district manager. So I learned a lot about operations and that really catapulted my career into the next phase, which was uh, to become a director of training in the flooring industry, which I've been uh, doing for the last 18 years. I've also authored two books. I never thought I'd be the author of two, much less one, but God put it on my heart, and I got one. Seven years later, I got the other, recently published. Everyone on this call either has or will soon have my uh, 64 Life Hacks book in their hands, and I strongly encourage you to read it. At least one page a day or a week will uh, keep you embraced and, uh, or engaged rather, and inspired to fight the good fight. Now, let me ask a couple of you on the call. Maple, let me, let me ask you, tell me what you see on the screen right now, Maple. A small red dot. Okay, well, let's expand now. What, uh, beyond the obvious, what do we see? <laughs> A red dot. <laughs> red dot. Drake, what do you see that's different than the red dot? Good answer, Maple. <laughs> it's a trick question. Trick question for sure. Drake, what do you see? <laughs> uh, I see a red dot that's off center to the left. Okay. And Robert, help us out. What do you see? It looks like I see a smaller version of the Japanese flag. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Guys, um, all your answers are correct. We're all seeing the red dot. But what I see is a background of white, and that represents possibilities. So in life, we are all going to face things where we see what's in front of us. But it's what's beyond that that is the sweet spot. It's what we strive to achieve or we aspire to become. And that's the white space that you're seeing right now. There's a whole lot more white than there is red. The red might be your problem that you're facing today. It could be uh, with your family, your pet might be ill, you might be in between jobs, that's the red dot. But what's beyond the red dot? That's what I want our focus to be on uh, during our time together today. How do we define success? Some of you might see it as financial, others perhaps in the degree you achieve, others may say relationship, or um, 
Oops, sorry, get this out of here. Others might call it work-life balance. While you might say, in my, if I have the right career and I have job security, that is how I define success, while others may say family. Well, in my case, I want it all. I want every single one of these and then some, because that is how I define success. Call it selfish, call it really needy, but I want it all because I deserve it all. I work my butt off to, to get uh, to where I am in life. And I want you guys to know that you can achieve everything you want in life. Don't be myopic in your view of what is next in life. Why can't you put a lot of action in, or things in motion and um, eventually you get everything? Why can't you have a successful career or a family or be an author of, on your own? Why can't you have a home if that's what you aspire to have someday? Why can't you have a, uh, a thriving portfolio that when you're asleep, you're still making money? So if you want to have a meaningful and fulfilled life, you must have lofty dreams. And I really want you guys to wrap your minds around that because simply waking up, getting out of the bed, doing the exact same thing as you did yesterday is not enough these days. I don't mean to scare anyone, but that's just reality. So 26 years ago, when I graduated from Cal Poly, degree in hand, I was part of an elite group, or so I thought. And then I realized that, you know what? Most of the population has that very same degree, a bachelor's degree. So what? How was I going to differentiate myself from the rest of the pack so that I would make a name for myself in not only society, but in the, um, you know, the, the workplace as well? So I started chipping away at it, started planning, organizing, and eventually, for the last three years, the training program that I built is ranked worldwide number 50. I also got my company on the best places to work list two years in a row. They had never done that in the 50 years prior. So guys, and all of these other awards that you see in front of you also happen, not by chance, but by having a vision. That is how I define having a successful career by giving to my organization that entrusted so much in me and invested so much in me, this is how I gave back to them. In their 50th anniversary, I got all these awards for them. But I, I don't say that to brag or you know, make you feel bad, but it's a starting point, right? You guys are fresh out of college, some of you. Some of you have been out for you know, uh, as long as I have. And if you're struggling with your career today, I want you to know that there is a brighter side to it. Perhaps you're just investing your time in where you shouldn't be. Perhaps there's, you, you need to deviate 90 degrees from that plan and that'll lead you to greener pastures. Whatever it is, keep in it, keep in the game, keep fighting for what you believe in. Here's my family and here are my two books. And guys, there's 40 million people who uh, uh, filed unemployment claims at the height of this pandemic. So going into April, there was a lot of uneasiness, uncertainty in the workplace. Companies were cutting headcount and thinking of ways to reduce payroll. People were getting uh, uh, their labor rate cut. If you were making 50 bucks an hour, they gave you a 10% cut and said, take it or leave it. If you want to continue to work, then you're going to have to take a pay cut. Other companies decided to um, eliminate bonus for 2020. So anyone who is in a bonusable position no longer gets a bonus for this year. So how cool is that if you're waking up to that bad news, right? Kind of ominous, isn't it? You're relying on that income and all of a sudden the world caves in. You either lose your job or somebody's say, taking your income away from you. Did you guys ever think about uh, how the homeless became homeless? Well, I am of the belief that we are all one significant bad event away from being in that position. We could be pushing a cart tomorrow if we're not careful. And that is part of my discussion today because I don't want us to have that single-minded focus that we're putting all of our eggs in one basket. That's a real scary notion if you think about it because if you didn't plan well enough and that one uh, thing you're sinking all your time and resources in goes awry, then you're up a creek. And I don't have to remind you what creek you're on, but you know what I'm talking about. Also, one of the main differences between success and failure, as I define it, 
is how long we take to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. I call that playing the victim part. Perhaps some of you have heard that. That's where you continue to say, woe is me. It was because of this person that I'm in the position that I'm in today. It was because of her that I lost my family. It was because of this or because of that. That's the victim part. And that needs to stop today, guys. Please take my advice. If you take nothing away from this meeting but this one message, stop playing the victim card because you owe it to yourself to give your 100% effort and positive attitude in every aspect of your life. So I'm gonna talk about five things today, and these five critical success factors are going to help you get to the next phase of life, okay, or, or achieve more in life. First, we're gonna talk about depending on no one but yourself. Next, we'll talk about assuming the economy will not improve. In other words, it'll get worse than what it is today. We're gonna build some infrastructure, we're gonna shift your attitude, and finally, we're gonna see things into existence. First, let's talk about depending on no one but yourself. So no one is the cause of your problems. If something bad occurs to me at work, I am the only person responsible for that um, occurrence. I can't blame a coworker, I can't blame, blame my boss, because having done so will only lead me to more victimization. I, if I allow myself to feel like a victim, I've already lost the battle. I go into the next conversation with that victim attitude and I've lost that uh, uh, talking or my credibility again. So again, maintain your positive attitude throughout. You have to get really good at disciplining yourself to shed bad news, just dust it off and move on to the next situation. Your destiny belongs to you. And I want you guys to have a whatever it takes attitude. If today I had to scrub toilets to keep my family afloat, then I would do that. But I would uh, venture to guess that a lot of people would probably never apply for a janitor position because they have a degree, because of where they live, because of who their family is. Again, whatever it takes is what it takes, and that's the attitude that's going to help you succeed in life. And I'm not calling anyone out. I'm not belittling anyone. Uh, but I do want you to know one thing. There's a lot of people today that have degrees, MBAs, PhDs. When I got my MBA, I thought for sure I was in the upper echelon in society and you know, people were gonna uh, jump at the opportunity to have me on their team. That didn't happen. I had to prove myself job after job after job and eventually it happened. I have never looked back on my career and said, boy, that was a bad decision. Why? Because it was planned from the beginning. As soon as I got out of Cal Poly, and I, Cal Poly guys, you're fortunate enough to have graduated from a great program like Collins College has, that it really set you up for whatever you want to do in life. If you want to go into hospitality, great. If you don't want to, like I chose not to, 10 years later, I've experienced and enjoyed a flourishing career in the flooring industry of all places, but I still use some of the concepts that I learned at the Collins College in my everyday routine today. So that discipline, carry that with you. The next thing I want to talk about is assuming the economy will not improve. So whether you're looking for a job today or perhaps you've been furloughed, you don't know whether they're going to call you back or not. Always be on full alert and don't take anything for granted. I want you guys to assume that the next chip to fall is gonna have your name on it and that you need to be prepared for the inevitable. We don't know what's next. We don't know what's on the horizon. This pandemic has really kicked us in the shin and other places and it's uncomfortable. There's a great deal of risk. People aren't getting their unemployment checks from months ago. People can't take, make their rent payments. There's a lot of risk and uncertainty out there. So always be prepared to um, control your own destiny, like I said in the previous slide. If you're in control of uh, everything that happens in your career, then you're in a great position. Then you can walk away on your own terms despite the economy, despite the uh, economic downturn. Perhaps your company isn't doing well and they need to cut labor. Your name should never come up. And even if it does, you've positioned yourself so well 
that any other company will be happy to take you. Make yourself valuable to your employer. In other words, never give them a reason to cut you loose. If you are, if you make yourself indispensable because so you help so many different departments, then why would they think of getting rid of you when they can get rid of two or three other people before you, right? So make yourself known throughout the organization. And I encourage you, if you're in a department, like I worked in HR and I'm part of the training side, right? So I oversee training within HR, but I also interact with people in marketing and in sales and operations. And I do projects with these teams, IT, and I'm a, a key component to them rolling out their initiatives. So if you make yourself that indispensable because no one else but you can you know, um, interact with all these other departments, then when uh, you know, the chopping uh, is going to happen, the furloughs or the layoffs are about to happen, your name most likely won't come up. Focus on quality over quantity, right? We all are great at uh, having a checklist and we all look for checking things off to feel good about our accomplishments. At the end of the day, we look at that checklist and we say, we did this, this, and this. We knocked out all of these things that we set out to. But how much, did you have quality in mind when you were uh, checking those things off? Or did you just get it done for the sake of getting it done? In this environment, it's critically important that we do things with quality in mind. And quantity is good, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't be productive, but you certainly want to produce good quality work. Next, become a profit center, if possible, not a cost center. If you don't know the difference, that means most functional teams in corporate America are what's called a cost center. They do not generate revenue for the organization. They simply are an expense, right? The salary, all the supplies that they order, all those things are costs. And thus, that department is known as a cost center. In my case, I wanted to become indispensable for the company. So I went out and got a contract for the state of California, $250,000, reimbursable dollars for every bit of training that I did in one year. And by golly, I got every dollar claimed from the uh, state of California. I handed that check over to the company, to the CFO, and said, here you go, you can use this for any reason, any purpose you like, including marketing expenses or to open new branches or buy a new inventory. And thus I became a, a profit center. I paid for my salary, in other words, and uh, instead of being a cost center for them. So make yourself uh, indispensable, okay? Think out of the box when it comes to this kind of stuff because you never know what they're saying behind closed doors. Take on a second job or start a side business. So this is really important and near and dear to my heart. I have in the last 10 years, Never had fewer than four jobs. That's four W-2s, not you know, one-off teaching here and there. Four simultaneous W-2 jobs going all at once. That means I left my day job in the morning after working you know, however many hours I did. I'd come home and I'd teach. And the next day, I taught at the next school. Next day, I taught at the next school. I had three, I was teaching at three universities and had my day job. So I've done that for 10 consecutive years. And you know what, guys, if that's what it takes to be successful as I define it, then that's what it takes. Remember that whatever it takes notion I talked about earlier? Well, this is where that comes into play. In my case, I had time. I had a stay-at-home wife. I had understanding children. And it all worked out for me. In your case, it may not. Maybe two jobs is enough for you. Maybe one is all that's necessary. But in my case, I love teaching so much. I have a passion to give back. And that's why I'm here today, guys. I, I want to help you guys or help position you to do whatever it is you want to do and uh, you know, however you define success. I want you to achieve that. Or if you need to start a new business on the side, right? Get a side gig going. For me, it's teaching Excel or it's putting on um, you know, one-off leadership classes. Or a company might call and say, hey, I have 30 employees. I need you to talk about situational leadership with them. No problem. That's my side business, right? Or I sell books. Whatever it takes, guys, to get the word out is what it takes, in my opinion. Next, building infrastructure. 
Promote your brand through social media. You are your best advocate. No one is going to um, sing your praises quite like you can. So if you're not on social media, and I'm not talking about the TikToks or the Instagrams or the world or Facebook, but I'm talking about a professional social media campaign to promote yourself, such as LinkedIn. I use that often. The other ones, I don't touch. There's just too much uh, risk and harm could come to my reputation that I'd rather not go down that road. But I find LinkedIn to be a professional outfit and I use it to my advantage. So use that also. If you don't have a presence on um, social media, I encourage you to do so. And remember, your reputation will precede you. So if you're posting uh, inappropriate things or saying inappropriate things out there, it's not in a private chat window like you think it is. Someone has that record and uh, employers are quick to ask for that information or at least they'll check out your profile if, uh, before hiring you. Just be careful. Don't waste your time with low ROI initiatives. ROI stands for return on investment. If you are unwisely spending your time on low ROI initiatives, then how can you possibly line yourself up with the right set of initiatives, right? For example, if I'm going out on Friday night with a bunch of friends, which I never do, but let's say I did, and I wasted my time, and then I got in this routine of going out twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, suddenly, if that takes me away from my, my ability or my time to teach, and I can no longer teach, that would make me an unhappy camper. So for me at least, low ROI initiatives, I just leave off to the side. If there are people that are um, you know, bringing me down because their attitude is always negative, I don't wanna be around those people. I want positivity in my life so that they can encourage me when I'm down to fight through those difficult times. So surround yourself with positive people, not necessarily like-minded people. You might be a negative person by nature. Perhaps you've had bad experiences in life. That doesn't mean you have to surround yourself with like-minded people who are continuously gonna preach bad things to you and say the glass is half empty continuously. And that leads you down the road of playing the victim, right? So I'm encouraging you guys to surround yourselves with positive people that will build you up, lift you up, encourage you to fight the good fight. Next, collaborate on projects with department leaders. I think I touched on this earlier. Make yourself be known throughout the organization. You have eight hours a day. If you use them wisely, you should be able to complete your projects and then go tackle other people, uh, up other people's projects with them. So collaborate, right? There's, there's a huge buzzword that we've incorporated into um, you know, society in the last five to 10 years, collaboration. So it used to be called unity. Then we uh, gave it a different buzzword. These days it's being called collaboration, right? It's working with other departments to get your name out there and move the initiatives of the company. Shift your attitude. So if you have not um, heard my, uh, you know, uh, my, my encouragement to that positive attitude is critically important, let me share these bullet points with you. These things are gonna help you achieve, win, excel, and flourish in life. You have, if you don't have these things going for you, then I'm of the belief that you've already lost. The most challenging battles that you'll ever fight are the ones between your ears. When you guys get around to reading my book, you're gonna read most of these things in there. What's between your ears? What's happening up here mentally? That's the toughest battle that you'll ever fight. It's not with your boss or a coworker. It's not your inability to get a you know, great paying job or finding uh, your, you know, your soulmate in life. Those things will come if you put yourself in the right position. But what happens up here between your ears is things that are often out of our control that we need to discipline ourselves to stop looking for gray clouds and start looking or noticing the silver linings. I know some of these sound like, sound cliche, or like a Hallmark card, but it's really important. Stop and think about it. If you're looking up at the sky and all you see are gray clouds, instead of saying, today's Monday, I have an opportunity to get out there and make an impact in somebody's life. That's the silver lining. Yes, it might be the sun might, might not be out, 
it could be 80% humidity out there today. Why, why focus on the negatives, right? Find something that's positive in your life and continue to go in that direction. You can preach a better sermon with your life than you can with your lips. Other people are watching you. If you're talking negatively about your boss, your company, your coworker, your spouse, your children, your dog, people are watching you. Guess how they're going to brand you when uh, the day is over. They're going to say that person is not someone I want on my team. But if you live your life in a positive way and you have, you're a success minded person, you're coming to work, putting in an honest day's living, you, you're uh, leading your, your family, you know, you're contributing to society, you're making impact in the community. That's how you are um, leading or showing people, demonstrating people through your actions and not your words. Faith without works is dead. That sort of goes hand in hand with previous uh, bullet. You can't just say, I'm praying that something shifts in my life. That alone isn't going to cut it. God is not going to put you in the position to fail, but God wants you to uh, put some action behind the faith. He wants you to focus on things that you want to do, and he'll help you cross the finish line. But don't just pray and expect. You got to put some motion or some action behind that uh, faith. Have a, se a sense of urgency in everything you do. 20 year old, I have a 20 year old son. He walks very slowly. He has zero sense of urgency. Why? Because to him, everything's taken care of. To him, all he has to do is wake up, go to school, or in this case, go to work, and everything else is taken care of for him. So have a sense of urgency so that people don't label you a certain way in life. Have a hop in your step. Ha have a smile in your voice. When you're talking, let it be known that you know, you're in the room. Make your presence be known. And remember the big picture. Why are you doing these things? You are focused on the end goal. Whatever that goal is for you, keep it in your lens and focus on it continuously. Learn from past failures. One of the chapters in my book is that it's okay to fail. You're going to make mistakes along the way, and that's totally fine. Learn from the mistakes, and you'll be better off for it. Don't kick yourself, in other words. And, um, you know, you're going to get bad news from time to time. We all do. But if you uh, allow yourself to, um, you know, harbor those ill feelings about not getting the job or, you know, the busted relationship, if you allow that to fester inside of you from one day to the next, then again, you're having a battle between your ears. And that's a very difficult one to wage. So I want to encourage you guys, have your moments. It's totally fine. I, I like to talk about that as talking below the line. You know how you uh, kick somebody below the belt, they say, or hit somebody in boxing below the belt? Well, let's talk about this in terms of talking below the line. It's okay to vent but do so in the presence of the right person. Don't vent for the sake of venting to the wrong person because that's how reputations are born. Do it to somebody you can trust. Do it behind closed doors. Definitely get it out of your system. But once those doors open, the new you, the new and improved you with the right attitude has to emerge. And that is one way that people will see you as a successful person. I didn't have to get dressed up today in this suit. It's hotter than hell right now where I'm sitting. But you know what? I did it because it's important to my audience. I want you guys to take me seriously. I want you to embrace this subject. And it's my reputation at the end of the day. And I'm not going to compromise any one of those things. You guys are too important to me to mail it in. So that's why it, I want you guys to take these, uh, you know, attitudinal adjustment points to heart. Avoid negative people. This is perhaps the most important thing that I do from an attitude adjustment standpoint. I don't surround myself with negative people. Some might call them losers, right? I don't want to be around people who are going to bring me down. Life has enough moments that bring me down. I can't afford to be brought down for an extended period of time. So I have to have positive around me. 
I have the BJs of the world around me. I have the um, Maple Hills around me to uplift me when the going gets tough. So I just call and I get smiles. I call or an email and I get uplifting messages. That's what we need more of, guys. So if you're not that person today, get there. If you're not that person to somebody else, hurry up and get there because your friend may need it today. Use positive language, right? Cussing is never appropriate. Using negative tone of voice, negative uh, is never appropriate. So use the right language for the right situation and the right audience. Challenge irrational thoughts. Again, in my mind, if I'm having a, a bad moment, am I having an irrational thought? Or am I, is this just a, you know, um, a phase that I'm going through that I need to quickly think of something positive? You know what happened yesterday to this point? I got some bad news. Somebody called me and said, Eddie, we're not going to be able to do this for you. For about 15 minutes, I was feeling pretty down. And I told my wife, I said, I need positivity right now. And what I think will shift my attitude is if I sell a book. So you know how many books I sold yesterday? Six books, and it all happened after that negative news. Do you think I would have sold a single book after uh, if I had had the negative attitude? No. If that thing had festered inside of me, I would have had a terrible day, and today's presentation would probably have been bad as well. Instead, guys, I'm on cloud nine, six books more sold, six more people will be influenced by my writings, and you know what? That makes me feel so good. So I went to sleep on cloud nine yesterday. It took 15 minutes. So I want you guys to think of silver linings over gray clouds. There is an opportunity every day to look and find silver linings. Express gratitude every day. Every single day you wake up, you have an opportunity to say, this is going to be a shitty day, or I am so excited about this day. Or be somewhere in between, but don't be too far on the negative side. You might have had a bad night's sleep. You might have a, a, you know, a presentation you're doing that day you're not prepared for, but it's all about expressing gratitude. You can shift the positivity in your attitude with the way you get out of bed. It's all, it all starts right there. And then smile more often. It's really difficult to be having a shitty day if you're smiling, try it sometime. It's very difficult to keep your teeth showing while you are expressing a bad attitude. Okay, so that alone might shift things for you. Give it a shot. See things into existence. We're almost done, guys. Be intentional in every area of your life. Have a purpose for everything you do. Remember I said earlier, do not go after low ROI or return on investment initiatives. Do not waste your time. Only focus on things you want and desire. Let me give you a couple of examples. When I go for an interview, I expect to get that job, okay? Now, in, before the pandemic started, I applied for another teaching job. And I don't know if you know this, but they're uh, building the SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, and they're gonna build a hospitality school over there, like a vocational school. So I said, let me throw my name in the hat. I have all this experience teaching hospitality. I have graduated from an awesome program, got the interview, and before I even talked to the person, I had already sent him my thank you card. Why? That was a, a bold move, right? But I was expecting to win the interview. I'm not going to risk you know, the mailman uh, delivering it late and then my, the person who interviewed me thinking, oh, Eddie wasn't even professional enough to get me the thank you card. I put it in the mail before the interview even started, the day before. Another example is ordering uh, inventory of books before I've even sold one. So, you know, when you write your book, hopefully you guys uh, take a stab at it. It's a really rewarding uh, feeling, but um, sometimes people don't buy your book for various reasons, right? I ended up ordering like 100 books before even one person had said, I'm interested in reading it. And since then, guys, I have ordered like three times that number just in the last couple of months. If you don't expect and anticipate things to happen in your favor, then how can it ever happen? You need to put action 
in place for you to achieve the goals that you set for yourself. I can't just say, God, help me sell more books. That's not enough. It's God, I am working my ass off to sell these books. I've exhausted everything I can do. Can you help me? I've now done everything in my power. Give that a shot, guys. Focus on things and see it into existence, which is my next point. And then in this last uh, bullet here, don't overthink things and don't shy away from challenges. If you miss one, focus on getting the next one. In the 80s, I'm an 80s kid. When I was growing up, my favorite arcade game was Miss Pac-Man or Pac-Man as you see it here. And I grew up kicking myself every time I played this game for missing one of the fruits. So in Miss Pac-Man, for example, there's the banana, which at, you know when you get farther along in the phases, uh, it's 5,000 points. And when you miss one of those, it's significant because you often don't get too many bananas floating your way. My mindset has always been, if I miss one, I'm going to get the next one. Whether that's a job that I couldn't get for whatever reason, because they required a PhD, for example, and I only have an MBA. That pisses me off, by the way. Or the, uh, you know, the contract with the state that I tried to get for the state of Texas to get more money for my company, and they said, sorry, there's something wrong with the application. Focus on the next one. There are 49 other states that I can go after if Texas says no to me, right? Think about it in those terms, guys. If I stop at the first point of resistance, then how am I going to um, achieve the next great contract in this example? Next, I want to talk about motivation versus momentum. Diana, how am I doing with time? You're good. Uh, you have about five minutes and then if you want to do a Q&A after. Holy cow, I better talk fast then guys. All right, let's talk about motivation versus momentum. We have two, we think they're one and the same. They're not. Motivation is the desire to do something. Momentum is the force that keeps you moving. So ask yourself these um, or questions, right? If you don't want to do something, are you suffering from motivation or momentum? That's actually a motivational issue. If you want to do it, but starting feels unappealing to you, your problem includes both motivation and momentum. You want to do it, but you've had several false starts or negative results and can't seem to keep it together, that's a momentum problem. So knowing which one it is will put you in the right frame of mind to either get started or keep you moving. And I have a chapter in my book that's dedicated to this very thing. So again, a lot of learning out there, guys. You don't have to read the whole book in one sitting like you know you would a conventional book. It's certainly not to be read like a Moby Dick. But I want you guys to dedicate one, five minutes a day to reading one page. Those five minutes are going to give you bullet points to think differently, to shift your perspective, and to win the next day. Maintain your momentum by keeping these three tips handy. Start small, no time for a full workout, just do five push-ups a day. If that's your goal to get fit, then how about if you walk five minutes? Take the stairs into, instead of the elevator when your building opens up. Celebrate progress, recognize your small wins daily. And this holds true for if you're leading a team also. If, if you're not recognizing your team, especially when they have small wins, please start doing so. Your team will appreciate it. You'll feel really good about yourself and it'll create a great culture within your organization. Number three, keep a did it list. This is the opposite of a to-do list like my wife hands me every day and she says, go get all these things done before you come to bed. I instead like to keep a did it list because I wanna measure my progress against the things that I set out to. So when I'm driving to work, and I'm thinking of everything that I could accomplish that day, there might be three things that come to mind. I want to list the things that I did that day. Perhaps it's not those three, but I got two other things done, and I want to feel good when I'm going home, like I accomplished something. The next time you need to boost your momentum, I want you to ask yourself this one thing. What is the one thing that you can do right now towards my goal, towards your goal? That's all you need to ask yourself. What can I do right now to get started on this goal? If you want to write a book, 
That's one of the hardest things to do. It, even if you're a great writer, it requires focus. It requires you to sit there in an uninterrupted fashion and to pour your, um, you know, your thoughts out on a piece of paper. If, if you really want to do that, guys, I'm using this as an example. Write one page a day, one paragraph a day if you don't have time for a full page. But you got to start somewhere. So what is the one action I can work on right now towards my goal? You want to be uh, you know, the CEO of a company and right now you're a manager? Well, where, how are you going to line yourself up to get the right training, the right development, to put yourself in that position when opportunity knocks? But you've got to do something different. You can't just get out of bed, do the exact same routine as you did yesterday, expect different results. It's never going to be the right time. You're never going to be 100% ready, and you're never going to feel like it. I promise you that. You have to somehow muster up enough motivation to help you get there. It's not about your glasses being half full or half empty. We throw those terms around often. I want you guys to focus instead on your glass brimming over. Sean's going to talk about mixology, the wine, uh, how to mix wines next week. Or, uh, but I want you guys to think in terms of how do I get myself to have a heap of or a heaping glass of whatever it is, glass of success, if you want to call it in everything that I do. So that you can have the family you want, you can have a career, you can have uh, you know, a relationship with your spouse, you can have the education, you'll never be in a position of one. If today I lose my job, I'm okay. If I lose all four jobs, I'm still okay. Why? Because I've planned these things out in my mind. Years ago, I said, I played the what if game. If no one hires me for an extended period of time, what do I need to do to put myself in a win situation? And that is, you gotta get the investments going. You gotta buy real estate. You have to do this, you have to do that. You gotta work towards paying down debt. We'll talk about money management at a later date, but I want you to think about that. If today somebody pulled the rug from beneath you, could you survive for an extended period of time? To me, that's how I define success, or one way I define success. And again, I'm not saying this to scare you, but I am um, giving you these words of advice from a friend who's been there. It's scary coming out of college and not having a plan. Start right there. What do you hope to achieve this year? And then start creating an action plan. What steps do I need to take to achieve this goal? Every year, try to do something different and you'll see the success train stopping at your house soon enough. Trust me guys, this book has something in it for everyone, regardless of where you come from, where you live, um, who you, you know, have interacted with. Um, as great or, or poor as your life is today, in your opinion, if you're struggling with finances or time management or you, can, you don't know where to start your, your health program or whatever, there's something in it for you. So don't let this be a doorstop like we do with many other books. Somebody sends us a book and we don't want to commit time to it. Don't commit more than five minutes a day or per week to reading one chapter out of this book. Each chapter is only one page. And I want to encourage you guys or offer up my um, time. If you guys ever need me, write down my email address and my phone number and I'll be there for you. We are a, uh, we're in a, uh, a group of um, that graduated, we're a network, okay? We have been through everything up to the time we graduated from Collins College in the same orderly fashion. What happened after that depends on the series of decisions that we made, right? So if you don't know which way to go, you're at a crossroads and you're frustrated, Stop being frustrated. You have a friend in me. If you ever need to talk, here's my contact information. I'll be there for you in a heartbeat. Okay? Diana, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, everyone, for allowing me to speak to you tonight. And uh, I look forward to more opportunities in the future. Just one more commercial about my August 11 winning the interview uh, session. That's going to be at 9 a.m. So I look forward to seeing you guys there. Diana?